to the to the last presentation of the session of this session is uh, by Juan Pedro Bolaños from the Instituto of Biología Funcional y Genómica de la Universidad de Salamanca and the title is Metabolic Shapes of Brain Cells and Functional Consequences. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to thank also the organizer for giving me this unique opportunity to talk to you uh, about our work here in Salamanca. Uh, for me, it's, it's a pleasure. As for the title, we are going to talk today on a little bit of metabolism. I'm happy that it has been already uh, covered a little bit by the two previous uh, speakers. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to focus on just one single aspect of uh, neuronal and astrocytic metabolism, just carbohydrate metabolism, and secondly, I would like to present you some data on a particular neurodegenerative disease in which altered metabolism may be uh, triggering or associated to the disease process and how can we stop it, okay? So first of all, it, it is very well known from a long time ago, especially from the work also from our friend Alfonso Araque, uh, that actually astrocytes play plays a, a very important role in coordinating neurotransmission. This is the so-called tripartite uh, synapse. This is very well characterized, and however, it has been studied very deeply uh, only in the sense of neurotransmitters release and signaling release. However, very little is known about how metabolism is uh, actually contributing to this process of the control of the synaptic transmission, especially uh, decipher how each cell type is contributing to the, uh, let's say, uh, overall process uh, f um, aiming to provide the energy and the signals related to neurotransmitter, which is related to metabolism. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of cover, and it has been tried for several years to try to understand that using in vivo models and in vitro models. However, the tools to study at the single cell level in vivo Metabolic fluxes is not easy. Actually, it's not available. There are just simple uh, recent approaches that this not always uh, uh, be uh, applicable to all models. And therefore, studying this aspect, in a specific aspect of metabolism in a complex tissue like the brain, is something that has not been easy so far. I'm going my, today to try to convince you uh, that there are some differences between different, between different cell types, but especially I'm focusing on astrocytes and neurons regarding how do they handle glucose or carbohydrate metabolism only. This is just in order to focus the, the, the speech a little bit on one particular aspect of metabolism. Obviously, there are many other aspects that are being covered, but I'm going to talk about today about that because of the limited time, right? Especially our work done in the few uh, uh, years before has led us to conclude that, I'm not going to enter into many, um, you know, primary data, that there's a massive difference between astrocytes and neurons in the way they metabolize glucose, right? Particularly our work has led to the conclusion that astrocytes consume glucose through the glycolytic pathway much more faster than the neurons do, about three to four times faster. That is very important because that leads the astrocyte to use glucose as an energy uh, substrate without the need to use the mitochondria. And uh, as we will see later, that may be also important for the neurons in a cooperating manner. Especially this is, uh, when you analyze how is this possible, we uh, identified that PFK1, phosphofructokinase 1, was uh, a key enzyme responsible for such an effect. Actually, the activity of PFK1 and not the expression, right? So this is something that could not be identified using the classical current tools like transcriptomics or proteomics, because this will not give you an idea of the activity of a particular enzyme. Actually, if you look at the protein expression and RNA messenger expression, expression of PFK1 in neurons and in astrocytes is virtually identical. So you have to measure the activity, and that is something that cannot be done in vivo. You have to take use of the primary cells and then to try to convert that in vivo as much as you can. So this is one of the first observations that was published a long time ago by Angelis is here, present. 
After hard work, we identified how that was is possible because PFK1 is activated by, allosterically by a metabolic uh, compound, which is fructose juice bisulfate, which is only produced by PFK2. The, uh, and that compound is only produced by, uh, in the brain by pfk 3 So that enzyme, as you can see in the right hand, in the right hand panel here, B, uh, pfk 3 is highly expressed in the astrocytes. However, it's virtually absent in the neurons. Right? So that obviously could explain why the astrocytes have active PFK1 and neurons don't. We actually proved that that was the case, and actually uh, we identified what was the mechanism of the regulation of pfk 3 in the neurons. Actually, if you uh, remove uh, CDH1, which is a cofactor for a ubiquitin ligase that we will talk a little bit later, if you, rem if you remove by silencing CDH1 here, you are able to completely uh, stabilize the protein of PFKB3. And that happens in the neurons very easily. So this is amenable to regulation. So in essence, what we found was that in the neurons, PFKB3 is a key proglycolytic enzyme that regulates presumably glycolysis through activating PFK1, but unfortunately in the neurons that protein is constantly degraded by APCCDH1, completely constantly, however in the astrocytes it's very abundant and that is uh, accounts for the highly glycolytic uh, phenotype of these cells, as you can see here. So when you measure glycolysis, especially uh, in these conditions, you see that there is a perfect correlation between the level of uh, PFK FB3 and the activity uh, of the glycolysis pathway. So how important is that? Uh, for instance, that uh, is perfectly fit with the so-called astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle that was proposed uh, a long time ago by Pierre Magistretti and Lupe Leran, indicating that astrocytes may serve as a lactate supplier to the neurons when there is active neurotransmission. I'm not going to enter into that topic because it's a little bit controversial and also because it's not the topic of this talk, so I'm going to pass away this. So I will go next, 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 next step, and I'm going to focus specifically on pfk 3 As I said, when you silence CDH1, you stop the ubiquitin ligase, which is called APC CDH1, right? Then pfk 3 becomes stabilized, and then you get an activation of PFK1, an activation of glycolysis in the neurons. Okay, there are other conditions in which you can endogenously activate or let's say stabilize PFK FB3 like uh, you know, excitotoxic stimuli like NMDA receptor stimulation, glutamate receptor stimulation, and also in ischemia. We have done that in the past. And actually we have discovered good, I mean we have deciphered what is the most likely mechanistic pathway that is leading to that. And essentially, is a calcium-mediated CDK5-mediated mechanism that hyperphorphorylates CDH1, and that removes uh, from uh, APC, and then it stops uh, um, uh, labeling pfk 3 for, for regulation. So pfk uh, fb 3 stabilization in neurons uh, is associated with excitotoxic process. And the, the question is, why? The thing is that glycolysis is a metabolic pathway that consumes glucose, but this is not the only pathway that consumes glucose, obviously. But there is always an overall recollection that the pentosphosphate pathway, which is highly active in many cells, particularly in the neurons, uh, plays a key, in, an important role in the uh, protection of these cells against oxidative stress. Because the pentophosphate pathway uses as glycolysis glucose 6-phosphate, as you can see here. Okay? So the pentophosphate pathway uses, in a similar extent, the same substrate. Actually, uh, both pathways, pentophosphate pathway and glycolysis, they compete each other right, for the same substrate, which is glucose 6-phosphate. So therefore, for instance, when you use 2-deoxyglucose to inhibit glycolysis, you are inhibiting glycolysis, but you are also inhibiting the pentophosphate pathway. So and therefore, the consequences are not all exclusively due to the fact that you stop that pathway, that may be also possible that you stop the other pathway. Indeed, pentoposis pathway, by producing any DPH, is essential for the regeneration of glutathione. And when you are unable to regenerate glutathione, you get more and more oxidized glutathione, and therefore the level, the endogenous or basal level of reactive oxygen increases, in, increases, and that is producing redox stress. Actually, this is the cause of the neuronal death that happen when you stabilize pfk 3 so that led us to hypothesize whether pfk 3 because it's stabilized endogenously under excitotoxic conditions, could be a therapeutic target. Uh, 
So we wanted to test that further using a more in vivo situation, obviously, because this was done in primary culture, so there is, should be amenable to the criticism or you know, concerns. So to do that, we developed a transgenic mice to overexpress uh, PFKFB3 and the, the promoter of CanCane H2. Right, in order to get expression of PFKFB3 exclusively in the neurons, we checked that that was the case in several areas: cortex, hippocampus, hippocampus, hypothalamus, as you can see. And the level of expression is not massive. It is a strong promoter, but you can imagine that because it is constantly subjected to degradation, actually the level that you see in the steady state is uh, the balance between the new synthesis and the degradation. So therefore you never reach high levels of the enzyme. Actually, if you m compare with the level of expression of the enzyme with the what well, you find in astrocytes more or less the same. So therefore we are reaching neurons to get elevation of PFKFB3 and elevation of glycolysis at similar level that we normally found in the astrocytes. As you can see here, there is an increase in growth, which was expected because of the switch from uh, pentosophic pathway to glycolysis. There is problems in memory, uh, uh, in, in learning and memory, especially in short-term memory. Uh, uh, you know, because can you see there the novel uh, audio recognition test? There is uh, a very strong impairment. This, ha this is observed as from three months of age, right? And it is progressive, and when, you, when they are eight months of age, they, they have a, a big problem. So because there is an increase in ROS that maybe is mediating that effect, we wanted to also genetically knock down ROS. And to do that, we use a tool that we also developed recently, which is a mitocatalase uh, uh, Mice, which, actually, uh, which is, f I mean, the expression of which is depends on the creativity. So, by, and this is actually very, very, very nice uh, approach, and it's, uh, it works very nicely. Not only in our hands, but the many other labs in the world that uh, are currently using that mice. So, we can make different cell, you know, mice lines in order to confine the expression of mitocatalase only to the neurons that do express PFKFB3 in order to see whether that rescues. As you can, as you can see, we can rescue rescue the ROS in the neurons, these are ex vivo neurons, and we can rescue the, 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 the cognition phenotype. So it seems like it is, uh, let's say, damaging in the sense of behavior for the neurons to have more glycolysis than it has to, to, to use normally. Actually, we also found that these mice were a little bit fatter, and indeed they increased a little bit of weight. That was very interesting because they ate a little bit more than the controls, right? So therefore, we look for the hypothalamus, because obviously cancainase 2 is also being expressed in the hypothalamus, in the hypothalamic neurons. As you can see there, there was an increase in ROS also in the hypothalamic neurons assessed ex vivo acutely, that was blocked by the mitocatalyzed mice. So therefore, we wanted to see whether that was able, uh, uh, alone, expressing PFKDP3 alone only in the medial um, uh, basal hypothalamus by injecting directly the adenoviruses to prescree uh, under a promoter, a neuronal specific promoter only in the hypothalamus during this experiment. And what we observed that there was no motor or cognitive deficit as expected. However, they have an, they, the observed increase in the body weight was also was reproduced, and also it was sorry, uh, uh, it was a little bit, I, and it was also reproduced the food intake and also some symptoms related with uh, uh, a loss of uh, tolerance to glucose. There are a lot of many characterizations of these mice that we have not been. Yeah, there is no time to show them, obviously, but uh, essentially there is uh, metabolic syndrome. So in essence, what we found. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm on time yet. Uh, so in essence, what we think is that when a neuron's PFK, I'm, maybe I'm going too fast, I'm a little bit, uh, is it? So I hope that uh, anyway, the concept is clear enough. So in essence, uh, what we found, I mean, I'm going too fast because I think that people is already tired and I want to finish early in order to go out for a beer. So let's, you know, but it will, I will be anyway, it will be just a few minutes. So in essence, the message is that the, the different cells of the central nervous system have different uh, metabolic footprint. And this is just one example. Obviously, there are many other examples, and the people are now trying to, uh, say, to show that there are 
uh, other, other mechanisms of regulation of different aspects of metabolism. Not only that, but glutathione metabolism, antioxidant machinery, fatty acid metabolism, cholesterol metabolism. And this is now to become something very, very hot in the, top, in the uh, topic in, the, in, the, in this field. So, but the regard, regarding glucose and carbohydrate metabolism, I think that this is important. Um, we believe that pfk 3 is a key regulator because it alone is able to modulate glycolytic pathway, a pathway that has 10 metabolic steps, and there is only one which is controlling the whole thing. So that's why we believe that this is very important. And in neurons, for whatever the reason it is, maybe because it has to allow the cells to have a sufficient active pentophosphate pathway to act as an antioxidant, allows the neurons to use very little glucose in order to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, be able for glucose to restore the antioxidant uh, status using the pentosphosphate pathway. So in fact, if you, uh, for whatever reason, increase the stabilized PFKSB3, then you get an inhibition of the pentosphosphate pathway, right? We have measured that. I mean, there is no data because uh, there is no time, but we can show that. And that causes redox stress. What we have also observed in that mice, in vivo, is that there is a depletion of NAD, and the depletion of NAD by inhibition of the sirtuins and acting through them toward autophagy pathway is causing an impaired autophagy. And that may be related to the mechanism of uh, the disease in the hypothalamus that we are exploring at the moment. So this is very important. This is just a, uh, I think, <laughs> uh, um, you know, this is a mice model, uh, right? This is a fundamental research. So maybe uh, I thought that maybe you like a little bit if I show some data in a model, in a mouse model of neurodegeneration in which this system may be uh, working. So that's why I'm talking about neuronal steroid lipophosinosis, <laughs> which is a, a disease that was uh, we are lucky that it was uh, uh, discussed earlier by Rafa. You know, I say that uh, this autosomal recessive in the vast majority of the case, it is not for all of them, obviously, as he uh, uh, perfectly said, but the, the thing is that it's a very devastating disease for children. It's a juvenile disease. They, they die uh, uh, quite early before 20 years, but sometimes it's as low as six years, depending on the, of the gene that it is related. It's the most frequent neurodegenerative in children. Right, so as you can see there, there is a lot of symptoms. They start losing the vision, uh, but they are also uh, they show epilepsy. They they have problems in the speech. They have problems in work and motor discoordination. It's really 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 devastating. The problem with that is that there is no cure at all. The only possible uh, hope. At the moment, this is the gene therapy, but unfortunately, no, not all of the genes that are mutated here are, uh, let's say, safe. It's a safe strategy. That's a problem. So as part of a, a, a European project that uh, I was part of it with, uh, in collaboration with Sarah Moll at UCL, we were uh, aiming to understand uh, whether this autophagy was related with uh, the regulation of metabolism. And that, that's what I'm going to show you in the, first, in the, in the next five minutes. And, and uh, before we, I finish. So I'm not going to repeat uh, this because I think that uh, Rafa explained perfectly that this is a, you know, a lysosomal storage disease. Uh, obviously, there, is, there are problems in the formation of the autophagal lysosome and in the resolution of this, uh, you know, this process. And actually, any drug that, can, that is able to uh, uh, promote the exocytosis of these, uh, let's say, autophagal lysosomes that are uh, getting uh, stored in the neurons uh, is uh, theoretically a very good candidate, a drug candidate for treating this disease because, uh, as I said, currently there is nothing. We were focusing on CLN7. CLN7 because there is one of those in which the gene therapy has failed. You know, if you put CLN7 to mice, they all die. There is no Whereas if you uh, restore the, for, by gene therapy any of the other, the, it is very good. You, know, you, you have success. So uh, there, there, is a, there, there is a need to find out alternative uh, pharma, uh, let's say pharmacological approaches in order to be able to palliate the devastating process of this disease. This is really devastating. 
It is now in the fashion of cylinder 7. It was published about, about four or five months ago. It is a chloride channel. But however, even if you know what is the function, actually what you, if you cannot restore actually the, the gene, you need to understand what is the process that is going on after that in order to stop uh, any, any step in the process in order to palliate the, the disease. So obviously we first wanted to check that actually there is a problem in autophagy in the neurons of this, this model. There is a model which is called CLN7 Delta X2, which is one of the most common mutation, uh, let's say alteration, yes, mutation uh, in, that, in that particular, uh, let's say, disease, CLN7. This actually, these mice, these mice reproduce very finely the symptoms of the disease in the humans. They die very, develop very rapidly the, the disease and they die very, very quite early. So it's a good model for, for this particular disease. As you can see there, there is a problem in the autophagy, autophagy flux. Uh, there are problems in the lipofuscin accumulation, uh, but also we observed that the, besides the lipofuscin accumulation, there were also abnormal mitochondria. The mitochondria in the neurons, this is just the, in the sum of the cortex, but we analyze more areas of the brain, obviously. The, uh, the mitochondria became swell, swelled and, and very big, the crystals were completely impaired and so on. So we analyzed the functional mitochondria by the seahorse. I'm not going to explain it, but obviously, as you can see there, there is an obvious decrease in the basal respiration and also maximal respiration. So there are problems, really, functional problems. And if you go to the respiratory chain, what we observed was that the uh, assembly of complex one to the super complex three is uh, impaired. The, the complex one is, uh, uh, that is free, the proportion of complex one that is free is much higher in the disease model, as you can see here, right, when compared to the rest, than in the control one, as you can see here. And that is associated with ROS production. Why is it associated with ROS production? I'm going to say you why. Uh, the work of Irene Lopez Fawel, who is here, I saw her before, uh, was very nice because we previously had shown that actually the level of assembly of complex one to complex three is uh, uh, important in regulating rust production. If you have and, and it's rust production and also uh, the mitochondrial efficiency, as you can see here. So when complex one and three are assembled very nicely, then you have a better efficiency of the mitochondria that was shown by Tony Enriquez uh, a long time ago from the CENIC. Okay, so as you can see here, neurons are more neuronal mitochondria are more efficient than the extracellular mitochondria according to the rate of oxygen consumption, which is compatible with the idea with the idea that the neurons normally they do have complex one and complex three assembled. Okay, so actually if you do proteomics on the different uh, bands according to the different levels of the supercomplexes, you can quantify that and you can estimate how much proportion of complex one is free in each cell type. And what we observed was that in the neurons, the proportion of complex one that it is free is much lower than that in astrocytes, which is actually uh, confirming that neurons do have a better assembly of complex one to complex three, making these mitochondria very uh, efficient. But in addition to that, it is important that with the electrons are not going to the uh, rest of the respiratory chain, complex one is able to donate one single electron to oxygen to produce superoxide, therefore initiating a ROS cascade. And that happens especially if complex one is mainly free because the efficiency of the electron transfer to the rest of the respiratory chain is lesser. So when you have, however, a better assembly of complex one with complex three, then the efficiency of electron transfer to the respiratory chain is higher, therefore you have less ability, uh, less chances of free electrons to go directly to ROS. So therefore, ROS is actually, ROS production is inversely correlated to the mitochondrial efficiency. And this is very important because it's conceptually, this is important because with that concept in mind, we might be able to understand why in some pathological conditions there are increased ROS formation, okay? So, well, actually, I'm, I, I was going to talk about this, but let's, let's leave. Uh, there is another working we, we observed that gross physiologically produced by astrocytes is important in regulating metabolism. But because it is a long story, don't worry, I'm not going to tell you about that now. We can leave it for the next year, for instance, or maybe two years' time. So, essentially, what we observe here is that in this disease, there is a 
In normal conditions, complex one is, is well assembled to complex three, the oxfos is efficient, and there is a very good energy transaction. However, in the disease, complex one is disassembled from complex three, there is inefficient oxfos, and there is an increased rust. So everything is fitting with the alteration in the structural organization of the mitochondrial respiratory chain. Okay? So to see whether ROS is going to play a role, we use again the same mitocatalyzed model, which is very efficient, and I'm going to explain you. Obviously, there are just different crosses. And as you can see here, we were able to see that the uh, ROS increase that was observed in the CNN7 mice could be prevented perfectly in the mitocatalyzed expressing one. So there is a tool in which can, we, we can restore to normalize the ROS production. And if you can see here, for instance, if you look to lipofusin, which is one of the markers of the disease of the, of the neuronal steroid lipofusinosis, there is an increase in lipofusin that is partially restored by inhibiting ROS production uh, using this genetic approach, and that is quantified. There are many others markers that we have, don't have the time here. Because we know that increased ROS is important, uh, therefore, for this process, and we know that, my, that increased ROS upregulates glucose metabolism, right? Therefore, we wanted to know whether glucose metabolism was involved in the disease by, by you know, acting uh, downstream of mitochondrial ROS production. As you can see here, the, in these mice, there was an increase in glycolytic flux, an inhibition in the pentobosis pathway, and an increase in PFKSB3 activity. So it seems like the pathway that leads to the stabilization of PFKSB3 is taking place in these neurons. We have more data to show that, but because of the reduced time, I'm not going to show you. It's only 30 minutes that, uh, to finish. So we use AZ67, uh, AZ, uh, which is a highly specific and highly potent inhibitor of PFKSB3 to prevent the glycolytic activation, and we administered that in vivo, in intracerebral ventricularly in order to prevent the glycolytic activation in the neurons of these mice. And uh, again, there was a partial but significant reduction in the lipofusin. So this is indicating that maybe inhibition of PFKSP3 and inhibition of the up aberrant upregulation of glycolysis may be a good strategy. This is just the uh, hind line uh, uh, clasping, clasping, uh, clas uh, clasping, which is also prevented with the drug, but I'm going to pass through. So in essence, what we are observing this disease is that in the, in the, in the, in the, in the diseased uh, gene, there is an impaired mitoch mitophagy, which is causing a ROS-mediated calcium activation of CDK5, which promotes, by the mechanism that I explained earlier at the beginning of the talk, uh, stabilize PFKFB3 in the neurons, causing an increase in the glycolytic flux and a decrease in the pentophosphate pathway, which causes redox stress and neurodegeneration. And therefore, that is strongly suggesting that maybe we should uh, tackle the possibility that PFKFB3 inhibitors may be useful to treat this disease. This is just preclinical data. We are now trying to see whether we uh, convince the awarding bodies to uh, you know, provide money to do uh, safety and then clinical stuff. We are in the, in, in the way of that. So in conclusion, that, this is just the conclusion. I'm not going to through them because I think it's very easy. Essentially, glycolysis is highly controlled in neurons and astrocytes, highly active in astrocytes, very low in neurons. This is due to the degradation of PSKFB3. And when it is upregulated BFKFB3, then you have an upregulation of glycolysis, which is aberrant and causes redox stress. This is my group currently and the funding bodies uh, who obviously I acknowledge and also you for your kind, very kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Pedro. I think it's time for closing this session. I will, I will thank uh, all the speakers, Juan Pedro and the previous speaker for the perfect, terrific effort to adjust uh, to the scheduled time, to finish on time. And we meet uh, again at the Hunter Hall at uh, half past seven. Thank you.